Hello and welcome to Steph TV. I'm your host, Nick Huzar. I'm also the co-founder of OfferUp. And, you know, I spent over a decade um, analyzing how people buy and sell. And I was curious about how my own existence impacts the planet. And I found it hard. I thought I could just Google this stuff. Uh, but instead, I just started to <laughs> decide to start this podcast and interview really interesting people doing interesting things in climate. And today I just, today's topic is really fascinating. Uh, we're going to talk about chopsticks. And uh, I'm super excited today to have uh, Felix. How do you say your last name? Uh, Buck, but that's okay. Well, you can just say I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to butcher it. Uh, with a company called Chop Value. You know, an interesting stat uh, most people didn't know is every day in China, 33 million people use chopsticks for lunch every day. And in the US, we have about 40 billion chopsticks that we import every year. Felix, thanks for being here and talking about this just interesting topic that I think most people don't think about. And uh, again, for today, you know, I'm going to keep continue to display my uh, different types of chopsticks that I got here while we're chatting. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for your commitment collecting uh, chopsticks since we first met. Um, and I know it's it's kind of a fun story. Oh, and they're even kids chopsticks. This is yeah. how my kid. This is how my kids learned. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, I, I I heard. I think when we met first, you said you you learned eating with chopsticks fairly late, right? So it's probably. 20, I was 24 eating sushi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, uh, you know, that's probably in, in most cities around the world where kind of international cuisine is getting more and more popular. It's definitely not the case. Yeah, uh, definitely not in Asia. So yeah, it's a fun story. I'm, I'm happy to be invited and chat a little bit more about it. How did you get into this? It's definitely not something that, you know, growing up in the Alps in, in, in Germany, you, you kind of grew up saying, I want to recycle chopsticks for a living one day. So that's not the story you're going to hear. But, you know, uh, during my, my career, Getting back into academia, I moved to Vancouver, um, BC, Canada. I very quickly realized how many um, sushi restaurants we have, and my partner and I we eat sushi a lot. And it was just very good ones up there, by the way. Very good ones, yeah. And mm -hmm. you, you kind of get to appreciate all the international cuisine, and then uh, you also notice things that maybe others who grew up here, you know, don't notice. And I noticed how many chopsticks we're using. You know, you kind of feel bad throwing them out after 20 minutes until I joked about it. Um, we because take, we also take ours home. Exactly. Here. Okay. Yeah. We, we use them. What started as a joke, you know, where, uh, because I studied bamboo, so bamboo is my expertise as a wood engineer. And I, I used to start joking about it, that if I ever run out of material, I can just start recycling chopsticks. And that joke kind of didn't leave my mind anymore. And then one day I just committed and said, let's do this. Let's, let's, let's turn in, turn this into something and see, and see if there's something there. And maybe we can kind of lead by example, what, what sustainability means. Yeah. Well, growing up in the Alps, where you play, you know, you said you had a, a background kind of in woodworking. Were you doing things like that out there? Yeah. You know, you, you kind of automatically, when you grew up in nature and in forests and in the mountains, you are, I think you developed this very indirect sense for having a responsibility for, for your home and for your environment. Never, definitely didn't grow up as an environmentalist or, 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 uh, any sort of extremes, but just like an appreciation for, you know, yeah. where we are from. Yeah. I think I was around 15 when I left school actually to, to become a woodworker because that's just how it is. You know, when you, when you go into the trades, you have yeah. really good apprenticeship programs in Germany. And I was a really proud and uh, happy woodworker when I was 18, 19 already. Yeah. Like you said, I grew up you know, in the Seattle area in the Northwest and uh, spent a lot of time outside. Um, and I just, I like to get outside. My, my wife's more of an indoor cat. And I'm, so I'm outside all the time. Like if the weather's yeah. good, get me out. I just got back actually from uh, Alaska. I took some of my closest friends and we did 130 miles in, in rafts down the Yukon River. Wow. Wow. That uh, sounds, sounds amazing. It would yeah. not and be I mean, for most people, but yeah, it was. I yeah. And it. you know, we're so lucky to be on the West Coast because I think it's, it's another unique spot where people do have this appreciation to get out into nature, you know, and, and escape kind of the busyness and the city and, you know, media, uh, into, in the forest and in the mountains. So we have this unique connection. And I think I just try to connect my career to that connection. And that's, uh, why I saw this it's as a great a passion, opportunity. passion of yours. The one thing I loved about being in Alaska, we were out there for six days is we set up camps everywhere we went and you were in the moment the whole time. So we went with some yes. guides and they were kind of, I think, used to having pampering kind of their guests. And we said, actually, no, I had a hatchet on me. Like I wanted, that's what I wanted to do all day. I wanted to chop wood and, you know, just be out there. Uh, yeah. But six days out there, I didn't really look at my phone. It was a camera. I mean, I mean it didn't matter anyhow. I wasn't connected to the internet. Um, yeah. But I was just in the moment the whole time. And it felt great. Oh, that sounds amazing. I'm very happy for you. I, I think having the chance to disconnect that way 
you know, many people talk about it, but very few people have the opportunity to actually experience it. It's absolutely amazing. Yeah, we, we were, that was the most remote I had ever been. We, uh, there's a time where all you realize how loud the birds are because there's no mm. other sound. We went for three, yeah. at least three days and we didn't see one other human. So yeah, I, you know, my, uh, when we first met, uh, you remember the, the background of my video was my old family home uh, in the Alps and we don't have neighbors. It's just a home in the meadows. And it's the same when, when my, my wife is from Mexico city. And when, when we uh, first went to bed in, 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 in my family home, she was like, wow, the birds, you know, you can hear the crickets, you can hear the birds, you can hear the cowbells in the background. I think that's a connection you just get to appreciate if you don't have it every day anymore. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. Especially Mexico. I mean, Mexico City. I mean, I think it's, that's yeah. the largest city on earth. There's not a that's moment. A contrast. There's not a moment that's... of silence there. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's yeah. like when I go to New York, I often I have these these Bose headphones on, but I also have to put earplugs in because it's yeah, yeah. the city. You know, three a.m. You'll hear some kind of moment. never sleeps. You know, so you had this this background and a passion about about going about this, and it kind of saw the opportunity. You know, where where did you go? I assume you researched for a while, but what was kind of the the inception of the the uh, your company. Yeah, so uh, quite the opposite. I didn't research it because I think if I would have done too much research, I would have not started this company. <laughs> so it's, it's sometimes go. the best ideas. <laughs> they just, you know, just go yeah. because, it, you know, you shared some stats at the beginning of the conversation, you know, 33 million chopsticks every lunch break in China, 40 billion chopsticks were imported to North America. Every stat you find is like we are currently proving them wrong in our business because it's, it's all too, too conservative or, or wrong estimates. Like the, the amount of unutilized resources we have in our cities, that's kind of where this whole frustration was coming from for me. I, I dealt with much larger numbers as a wood engineer. I worked on the uh, construction waste from the, from the housing market. And those are numbers that we just, they're too big to grasp. So, you know, as the average Joe, you, you just don't understand what 600,000 tons of wood waste means per year. You don't even know what it looks you, like. Yeah. No. So you don't have the same emotional connection to that number as you would have to 100,000 chopsticks per day that you're throwing out in Vancouver. And then everyone is like, wow, 100,000 chopsticks. Are you sure? And I'm like, let me show you. Right. And I think this, this, this kind of action of let me show you drove me to, to start the brand chop value. So all I wanted to do at the beginning is I wanted to prove people that they're wrong. They are not focusing on, on all that potential that we have on, on, on waste as a resource. And I thought if I could create a viable business model with something small and humble, like a chopstick, maybe people start listening. Maybe people can translate that, 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 that model into much larger problems that we're having, because I always have to remind my team, I never want to say that we're actually saving the planet with what we do, you know, like our, our crazy chopstick uh, journey is tackling 0.015% of the global waste problem. So let's be real like yes we have a tangible impact it's measurable too we're doing it well but i think it's really just this thought leadership piece that is important to us to make sure that other much larger industries can hopefully copy and adapt from our innovation and have much larger impact yeah I, everything you said i just i think is so wonderful and you know the challenge when you think of waste and manufacturing is just there's so much excess value just sitting there in our waste stream and it's only because it hasn't been ec economical you know to, until now more people are really focusing on it to extract that value and so you think about it and, and just i think in the future we want things to be way more localized so that means we just have to figure out in the waste stream how do we tap into that in a more economical way and if you could do it at least at break even then then you've got a viable you know, I think business and that historically, I know there's been a lot of talk around, oh, it's so much more challenging. There's that's true in probably some cases, but I also think there's just um, hopefully society is now at a state where like, hey, we can rethink these processes that we've had around for decades. Yeah. And if you rethink them, you, you know, I'm not shy in saying like you have to make money when you solve these problems, because that's the only way how you can scale them. I mean, you know this best with, with your previous or, or current businesses, but if you don't find a model that actually creates sustainable success, people will not go all in. And, and this is what we try to show. Um, you know, there's this example I always bring on how I explain circular economy, because I didn't know what circular economy is before I started my own business. So if you turn a one cent item, you know, one of your chopsticks that you have in your little box collected for me, if you're turning one cent item, into another one cent item. For example, you grind up the chopstick and you say, we're making now 
toilet paper or we're making paper in general, then you're literally just, you're having no value creation in, in the process. So you're turning a one cent item into a one cent item. But if you wanna actually make it sustainably successful and you wanna make sure you can afford logistics, the pickup of these chopsticks, your people, your brand, and obviously the, the process that turns the chopstick into an end product, then you need to create this value curve already within your business model. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we're doing well. So when we're looking at you know the back of this little wall decor, our first product line that 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 we launched uh, many years ago, we're turning this one cent chopstick into around you know fifty two cents. Yeah. So there's like a factor that we are putting to this very underutilized neglected resource mm -hmm. because of the beautiful design because of the engineering because of the quality of the end product we can then afford uh, circular economy principles mm -hmm. and that's what makes us successful exactly yeah i think it's great and i know you have you like you said earlier you've got way bigger ambitions than just chopsticks right this was kind of your your v1 it's it's a story that gets us uh, in every door because it's you know it's almost like a very innocent story that uh, that big brands can 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 commit to, you know, they're like, okay, the chopstick guy is calling me. Of course, I'm gonna work with him and and uh, his great team because there's no greenwashing. It's very transparent. It's super easy to understand, and all our clients can communicate our story super super simple to their customers. Mm -hmm. For example, if we are building a restaurant interior, of course, now that restaurant can tell our story to their clients that the tables and the beautiful feature walls are built with you know hundreds of thousands of recycled chopsticks that their clients have eaten with yeah and uh, so this is a simple story but the model you know you're right the model is really built to scale beyond chopsticks so you know what else can we turn with the same manufacturing principles you know hyper local in all the cities that we're operating now what else can we urban harvest and turn into a new innovative material and a commercial end product. That's obviously our three, four, five year plan now. Mm -hmm. And as you think about moving into these different geographies, I mean, I assume you're, you're collecting and manufacturing. Do you do everything there? I and mean, it sounds like yeah. you've got a lot going on yeah. in the background there. I hear like a fork. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. That's why That's I'm okay. wearing headphones because, okay. you know, we never had to have this conversation of staff returning to work. They just, they're just like all back all of a sudden. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's a lot going on because we, within our facility, we, we call our concept a micro factory. So these micro factories, they're designed that in a, in a footprint of around 3000 square feet, we can, uh, we're handling the supply. So the reverse logistics where the material is coming in, we're handling the entire manufacturing process all the way to the end product fulfillment and distribution in the local market so that these micro factories can be fully independent businesses in every city where they pop up. Mm -hmm. So right now, you know, we, we can manufacture hyper local from coast to coast in North America because we have micro factories across Canada and the U S we also have micro factories now in Mexico, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, and I probably forgot a few countries that would be mad at me when they're listening wow. to this podcast, but it's really exciting for us to see that there are franchise partners. So we are, we are using franchising as a tool for growth. Mm -hmm. It's really exciting for us to see that other people invest into the brand, into the technology, and that they can actually understand mm -hmm. that this is how can how they can have an impact in their local community. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, I love, I love the whole end to end and the local, because like you said, you're taking this waste stream and you're, you're turning it into value. And so you just have to figure out where exactly do you want to put these. And so are you kind of in a, yeah. Uh, like where are you in your kind of evolution? Like, when did you start this? Or it sounds like you're really kind of growing into these really interesting areas. Yeah, I think we're at the new inflection point and you, you don't know when this inflection point is coming until you're in the middle of it. So I started this around six years ago and that was just like that crazy beginning. I uh, couldn't believe that this crazy idea is actually a viable business model. Um, was flooded with chopsticks that I needed to then process into, into end product. Here's my biggest ones I have, by the way. Perfect. Drumming. Yeah, I'm not sure where you stole them, but I think they're actually serving chopsticks, you know? So My wife cooks with yeah. these. <laughs> oh, perfect. Yeah, that's why. Serving sticks, yeah. Um, so yeah, like six years ago, we started this this, this adventure and around uh, three years ago, uh, we started franchising. So from, from a single location in Vancouver to now over 60 locations in development around the world, that took us around two and a half to three years to develop. And and we have quite some traction. So, you know, that, that commercialization track record helps us. Mm -hmm. uh, the technology is well perceived. It, it operates now in, in multiple countries. 
so that helps us to kind of build a really good structure. And, and I mean, I, because we have bigger plans, I call it a global pilot, you know? So I think we're just at the beginning stage, but I think that's a, yeah. a founder syndrome. You're always saying you're at the beginning. You can always go bigger. Exactly. Well, I think, but back to your point, if you want to think big, you know, chopsticks, great. It gets you in the, I love, I love the, the genuine story. It gets you in the door, but also you're starting to build out these manufacturing. I mean, that's the real asset. If you can do that, figure out how to do yeah. that at scale, you continue to do a lot of interesting things on top of that platform. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, and you come from tech. So I love that you call it platform because I just learned this two weeks ago. Someone said, hey, Felix, what you're actually doing is you're building a platform and then you can turn the switch yeah. into different resource streams because you already have existing facilities around the globe. And to back this up, we, you know, we, we do life cycle assessments for each of our facilities so that we always know our carbon footprint. And the beautiful thing is, I think many companies, they need to make a, a compromise in how they scale because their, their carbon footprint might be, um, you know, off if, if they're scaling too fast. But in our business, every single facility is carbon negative. So the faster we grow, the better our carbon offsets. Yeah. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's beautiful to know that there is no such thing as too fast of a growth for us yeah. because that means just more waste is converted into end product and uh, more carbon is offset and stored in, in our beautiful functional end products yeah. as a revenue stream. It's like the, it's like the greatest yeah. byproduct. I was, I've been talking to a lot of companies about measuring, like how do you measure CO2 and the impacts? And like, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, I think part of the challenge we have as a society right now is um, you can't improve what you can't measure and nobody really knows their impact. Oh, I don't know, it's too complicated. You can actually yeah. break these things down and start to understand like the impact of certain things. And I think, once people understand that, then hopefully companies start to get really focused on, um, okay, now I have a number. What can I actually do mm -hmm. to kind of improve it? I think that's just one of the biggest challenges. Yeah, the work. you're right. I think this is another responsibility for us as this little chopstick, you know, craziness. I, I, I think we, we can actually educate how we do it and hopefully others can adapt our approach uh, because we share all our calculations. We share everything in our urban impact report online uh, for download. So how we do it, just very brief, is common sense. And we're trying to measure everything that we can measure. And we're getting verified assumptions for the things that we can't measure. So what that means is we obviously need to measure how many kilometers do we drive to pick up the chopsticks, how much gas is, uh, what are the emissions of the vehicles, uh, what are the emissions of the transportation methods of our employees, what are the emissions of uh, logistics for the products that is shipped. And that is justifying that we get more and more hyper local and then we can also measure the electricity in our facility you know if we use less electricity because our machinery is very lean and efficient how do we redesign the process what's the perfect footprint of our micro factories to make sure we always break even in our energy levels and then we offset that by what's the total volume in in, in kilograms or pounds or tons of waste we're actually yeah. um, getting into the facility that otherwise would absorb emissions on the landfill into the atmosphere that's right so this is the balance we need to find right and yeah. and if you if you have an understanding of the entire process then you can start optimizing that's right. first report on it to be transparent and then you optimize against it so this is how we tackle it and you know from the feedback that we're getting from third party uh, like uh, verifiers and, and auditors is uh, transparency is key like the more you share the harder it is to actually attack your your calculations. Yeah, my, my hope at some point, you know, is, is you know, in the in the 90s, uh, uh, it was mandated that we had to put nutrition labels on all everything in the U.S. Before that, they didn't. Like, no one really cared what a calorie was when I was a kid. Like, nobody drank. Yeah, yeah. Nobody carried these around and drank water. Like, what we yeah, yeah. what we drank was soda and like Capri Suns, like the worst thing ever. And I then, know. And Capri then, Suns. It, I grew up with that. Oh yeah. And the <laughs> calories came out. Everyone cared. And there was a, you know, yeah. then this whole. And, 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 and so I hope that my hope is just like the nutrition labels at some point, I think every product should have some kind of carbon label and then you could scan it. You could go, you could see the details online, yeah. but it's, I think it's going to require a, a methodology that gets a stamp just like the nutrition labels. It says, okay, this is mm -hmm. the right approach. And then it's going to take, I think some, some thought leaders to just start to adopt this. And then hopefully, like you said, you know, because there's some companies that are wonderful. Like I've been looking at who's some of the most the most sustainable companies out there. The two that I looked at that are really interesting is Apple. You'd say, well, Apple, man, 
Nope. They're one of the more, it's, I think they have like a, like an A rating in terms of how they're uh, measured. And the other one is uh, uh, um, Target in the U.S. is a retail store mm-hmm. as well. But like Walmart, mm-hmm. for example, has like a C rating. I forgot the exact uh, score that's measuring this. But I think it looks at some of the things you're talking about end to end. Like what is the products you're getting? Where are you getting them from? And so. Yeah. I, well, and it's, it's funny, right? Because these ratings, what they actually, like the requirements for these ratings are, are pretty simple to start with. Yeah. Uh, it's all it like all it starts with is do you actually know where your stuff is coming from? <laughs> like, do you have the ability to track it? And then you get a rating for it. It's it it doesn't consider you know where it's from and what it is. Right now, like all these ratings actually care about is do you know your shit? You yeah. know, and then <laughs> and then you scale it from there to improve it and, and optimize it. So, yeah, you know, no brand, no company sh- can afford to actually miss that. Missed, missed the bus on that. Yeah, and I think it's still early. And again, my hope over time is government will create tighter policies and, and do a better job because I think that's what's that's what's going to take. And if you look to Europe, Europe, especially Sweden and Norway, I don't know about Germany how they are, but uh, it seems like they're just they're the thought leaders. I look up to them and what they're doing in sustainability mm-hmm. because you have it from government creating pressure. You got just citizens that are really way more, I think, bought in and moving. Yeah, um, I just feel like in the U.S. we're moving a little slower. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I'm not sure if the policymakers uh, can keep up with um, if if there's actually an industry leader who who can who can give the give the pace. So I, I just know it from the wood industry. I think the best policies that were done by by governments or adopted by governments was the adaptation from the IKEA standards. So you know, as consumer. I don't necessarily like IKEA, but as wood engineer, I admire IKEA for their, for how they have set standards for their own sustainable forest management, how they have standards for automation and efficiency in manufacturing, because, because of the pressure that they set on the industry, policymakers had to follow because they all of a sudden saw the biggest industry player is doing it. So we have to follow through really, really quick. Um, you know, I'm hoping that I can play my part with Trop Value. Even even on the scale we're operating, I think we actually have the exposure uh, as a business to to set a new standard for transparency in the in in the circular economy for our for our measurements. You know, why like if there's only scope one or scope two required to report on in in carbon measurements, you know, why not going the extra mile and report on the things that are optional, even if it makes you look worse, like. Transparency is key, and I think with that you can lead by example and hopefully make others follow, or at least let the client decide. Should I ask other brands why they're not reporting on the optional scopes? Yeah, I would love to start to see reporting over time, just like people report quarterly earnings. What, yeah. what, what, what's, what's sure. your impact to the earth? And keep it simple; it doesn't have to be super hard, but something that kind of gives mm-hmm. gives people an idea that hey, we're a company and we care, and look at here are the things that we're doing. I just feel like, manufacturers, like manufacturers, manufacturers need to have more accountability in the mm-hmm. byproduct, the waste they're producing. And today, I just think it's, I think it's very little. Or simple answers: Where's your product coming from? Who produced it? And what's in it? For all products, because that that alone, we don't know that. You know, for for your couch or for your chair that you're sitting on, you know, I doubt that the ones you actually bought it from knows that, because okay. it it goes through so many hands. Oh, I see. In the supply chain, you're just saying, yeah, no yeah. one knows where. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the trickier part, especially for more complex products, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, as you look to, you know, where you are today, and say, like, if you could look in your crystal ball in the next five years, like, what are you hoping to, you know, do? Maybe stay the course. You want to branch out in new products, and what, what's your vision? We'll take it one one step at a time, or we we say one chopstick at a time. Um, we. We have now recycled over 115 million chopsticks to date into new products. So it's, it's starting to become an, a real measurable impact. And uh, like step one is we want to have a, a micro factory in every city in the world because that allows us to have real impact on how we are transforming already existing resources from a linear economy to a circle economy. That's step one for us. And I think then we need to align with others that have much larger waste stream problems uh, to actually use our platform, as you called it, uh, and then branch out to other resource streams. Do you have a, a location in Seattle yet? Not yet, uh, but we have a uh, we have a really exciting partner in Seattle. Um, 
maybe maybe you know him. Uh, his name is Edgar Martinez, uh, Hall, of, Hall of Famer baseball. Edgar uh, Martinez. Oh, everyone knows yeah. Edgar here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he's an incredible supporter of ours, uh, and uh, is is very motivated to bring our concept to Seattle. I was going to say, there's a lot of you know, just a lot of Asian population yeah. here, and so there's just I'm on it, Nick. Great I'm on it. Let me let me know when it's here. I'll make sure we go to some place and figure it Thank out. Thank you. I even have a yeah, bunch I'm of restaurant it. friends. If you ever need a few places to get in front of, I'm happy to make an intro there. That'd um, be amazing. Oh, and so then remind me. So you, you essentially, if you're a consumer, so if I'm in a restaurant, I'm eating, you just simply have a, yeah. bin, a, a bin there. It's just, it's That's just it. like, Hey, you know, I just assume there's some, is there a special label that says what it did, where it's going? Yeah, it's, and, yeah it depends a little bit on the market and if it's facing the, the customers or if it's a bin in the kitchen, but usually we have our brand on it. It tells a little story. It has a, QR code for, for, you know, how it's made. Um, and then you get automated, autom automatically you get sustainability reports as a restaurant every month that shows how much waste have you converted with shop value? Uh, what does that mean for a carbon footprint and so on? Any, any, anything else that you think might be worth poking into? Um, you know, there's only like the, the one topic, why it's important for me that we're actually franchising the concept. Um, that was actually very intentional. Like I, I'm not a franchising guy, I'm an engineer, but I wanted to find a way to to scale responsibly where where small business owners actually have the opportunity to feel part of it. I, 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 you know, we didn't want to just own all these locations and, and have this ego that we know how all these local markets work. We wanted to make sure that we find a model where small business owners can own our business in their own community. We believe that that is kind of the business model of a grassroots movement. You know, I, I, yeah. I learned that English term maybe two years ago and I thought this is exactly what we're doing on a, on a business model scale. And I, I love franchising for that way as a, as a tool for growth, just like financing is a tool for growth for us. Franchising is a tool for growth uh, because we take these, these really committed, uh, you know, younger entrepreneurs that, that really can operate our system, we can take them on this journey with us while we invest ourselves in the key markets that we want to own ourselves. So, uh, yeah, that's important so you, to so me. You do, you know? So you do both though. So you franchise and you will grow your own facility. Yeah. So this is kind of the, the hybrid model. So there are some key markets where we see such a huge uh, need for our concept that we want to make sure we, we, we show that we invest into it ourselves. Yeah. So I give you the example with uh, Japan is obviously a dream to expand to, uh, and we would obviously expand to Japan in stages. You know, stage one is is our own office, our own micro factory, our own local team that has to is trained and has the strength to then branch out in in own locations and the franchise model in Japan, making sure that we really really tap into the full potential of, uh, you know, chopstick into end product. Well, awesome. I really appreciate the time, Felix. And, uh, you know, I never thought I'd be getting on a call talking about chopsticks when I started. Me neither. Us. But it's, I, I think it's Me neither, fascinating. Nick. I love the story and the vision and where you're going. I just think it's, I want to see you go faster. I mean, there's so much opportunity. Thanks, Nick. Really, really appreciate it. Always happy to share the story. And uh, yeah, if you have chopsticks, you know now uh, where, to, where to put them. Thanks for the time. Thanks, Nick.